Uh, thanks, everyone. It's good to be here. What I'm going to do is turn my camera off just to make sure we don't have any issues with the connection. Um, but I'm going to give a, a brief overview of my background, a couple of those questions we saw on the agenda. But please feel free to, to ask questions as we go along. So very quickly about myself. So uh, my name is Dan Louis. I work for a, I'm a head of business development at a medtech company that specializes in remote patient monitoring. I'm also the co-founder of a rare disease charity, as I mentioned, for Tay-Sachs disease. And that's what my daughter, Amelie, my oldest daughter in the middle, uh, she suffered from. So she, she was diagnosed at uh, 50 months of age. Now, like many of you on the call, the impact by rare disease, it tends to be one person that kind of strive, drives us forward to set up patient groups to make a difference in the landscape for, for the disease. And for us, our case, it was, it was Amelie. There was no charity providing any support here in the UK, actually with, throughout Europe. So we were told the usual, go home, your daughter's going to pass away by the age of three. There's nothing anyone can do to help. So, like many of you, the same kind of story. We wanted to make a difference. So we set up a, a charity to look into research and provide a, a network and a community, and also to try and get in with um, pharma and different clinicians to drive, drive forward you know, treatments, because we were really looking for a way which, you know, to make a difference to our daughter's life. Um, and through that work, we set up charities throughout Europe. We partnered with long-standing charities like BML to try and provide a level of support to families uh, that didn't exist and also to drive forward that research and work with pharma and, and different stakeholders to, to make a difference. And this will all come into a bit more context as I go through the, pre the presentation. But I will, I will say this regularly, that uh, collaboration is key and teamwork makes a dream up. And for us, what we've definitely seen is being able to work with pharma, work with clinicians, work with researchers, work with patients, work with different patient groups, work with people from all around the world, different countries, different languages, different backgrounds. You can actually make things happen. So in our case, this is the landscape when we set up the charity in 2011. There was one potential treatment. Daniel, this was still Daniel. very early stages. And, yeah, this is yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but we have lots of non-English uh, speakers uh, in the call, and uh, ah, too quick. Uh, would you, yeah, yeah, just slow a little bit, and that's that will be fine if you can. Okay, sorry. So uh, back in 2011, this is the this was the landscape for us. There was um, only one potential treatment being worked on, which is a gene therapy program in the UK, but it still had no funding, and we were literally had no other a potential option for not just for family but for other families so we fast forward in 10 years time this is the landscape now so we have actually two gene therapy programs which are currently recruiting we have drug repurposing studies that have started we've got substrate with different small molecule and um, therapies started we've got other therapies being investigated and all of this has been done on the back end the back of the work that we do as patients and patient groups by bringing everyone together all these different stakeholders and holding them true to the values of what we have as patients and patient groups. So for us, this is really important because we've been able to make this big shift in 10 years because we wanted to work with people and we wanted to help drive forward the research, the treatments, and actually help them develop uh, disease-specific problems, disease-specific pros, and a clinical trial design that worked. For me, the biggest uh, crime would be to have a clinical study for your disease that didn't fail because it, the clinical um, the drug didn't work but failed because the actual clinical trial design wasn't done very well and when I throw this into the into the pro and proms this is this is incredibly vital so the question we're asking is how to develop good proms for your own disease now I'm going to take you through kind of the experience I've gained through my working career but also personally from what I've seen in time and how we've been able to shape endpoints for example for the disease and many of the studies we've been involved in by actually speaking up and being willing to give our view and to work with pharma to researchers and clinicians to make that difference so kind of the first thing that i think is very important is to understand these four points terminology understand what everyone's talking about in terms of the data that's going to be collected disease everyone needs to understand the disease every disease is very different engagement how you can engage the different stakeholders and the different communities you'll be working with and also collaboration It's really really important that you, everyone takes a collaborative approach because that's how you can drive forward uh, 
treatments for your disease. And the one example for us has been driving forward a study that within three years, we've been able to go from the initial idea of a drug repurposing study to actually get the trial started. And that was because we worked very hard with the company regulators and other charities as part of a basket trial to make that study happen. And there wasn't a collaborative approach and everyone understanding how to do that, we wouldn't have been able to do that so quickly and actually have a treatment option for, for the families that we support. So in terms of understanding terminology, what is what? There are so many phrases out there, patient reported outcome measures, PROs, there's EPROs now, there's uh, clinical outcome assessments, ECOA, patient reported experience measures. It's really important to understand what everyone's talking about as you develop a problem or a pro for your disease. It's really important that you look at what you want to create. And for me, this is a really important bit that we that sometimes is, is not looked at hard enough is what is the end goal? And I like to look at these things backwards. So the first thing you, we always do is goal set. So what is a goal? You need to set an achievable goal. So in this case, we want to develop a problem that meets the needs of the patients, the patient community. It meets the needs of the clinicians and researchers. And then who's involved in it? Most importantly, your patients, the patient groups. There's researchers there's farmer, there's all those people involved who can drive you towards that goal. The next one is how do we do it? And then we'll go through these stages shortly, how we can work towards that end goal. And then the first real point is how do we set the goal and why are we setting it? We all want to have a treatment. That's kind of the end game for everyone in any rare disease or any, any disease having effective treatment. But to get there, there are these stages. And that first stage of that goal for us here is a PROM or a PRO that can actively can actually measure the impact of a disease on individuals. And this again is another really important slide. And I've done this as a circle and as a jigsaw, because there is no one group of people who is you know, standing above everyone else. Also, we all work together. Patients are vital. Without patients, there's no patient group. There's no clinicians, far more aren't interested. Um, patient groups are the people who can make things happen by bringing these groups together. Pharma can make things happen because they can help you develop a treatment. And the clinicians are vital in this entire process because they are the ones who will be uh, helping you develop a pro or a prom that would be specific for your disease. And working together as stakeholders can make a big impact. And many of you may have heard of Hercules, which is what the uh, Duchenne community, the uh, Duchenne UK have done, which is create a massive group of different backgrounds, clinicians, pharma, patient groups and patients to drive forward research in Duchenne. They've been incredibly successful. I'll talk about them when we go through quality, uh, the quality of life measure they created. But that's an, a really great model for us all to look at and learn from and how we can actually work as a collective cohesive group to drive forward research and drive forward the development of these really important tools. And then we look at setting the goal. It's really important we listen and we learn. We listen to the patients, we listen to the clinicians, we listen to pharma, because everyone within that group has a different motivation in terms of what they want to get out of what you're trying to develop. You need to learn from each other because the learnings you can take from working with one group can impact you when you develop a problem or problem another group. And you need to be brave. You need to be brave because you need to make a difference. It's not good enough anymore for us all to sit and say, well, it worked for that rare disease, this, this particular problem, this pro, or this quality of life questionnaire. No, you need to be brave and stand up as if it doesn't meet our needs as a rare disease community. It doesn't make our needs as our disease community. What can we do? And you mustn't always put the patients first because at the end of the day, if we don't do that, why are we here? We're all striving to make a difference to our community. And in working together, again, I'll go back to the jigsaw. Everyone is bringing something different to the table and we're all working together, but there will be bumps on the road. There always is, actually, because everyone wants to develop something slightly different. It may be because they want to measure something more clinical or something that isn't that impactful community. I always take it back to personal experience. What would I have been wanted to have done when I'm recording and taking part in a clinical study with my daughter, what I want to be bringing her into the clinic all the time, what I want her to be doing lumbar punches, what I want her to be doing tasks that didn't actually reflect the impact of the disease on her. Of course not. I'd want to be doing something that actually showed the disease progression. She had a neurodegenerative disease. So from the age, she diagnosed at 15 months of age, by the age of two and a half, she'd been fed by a tube, 
She had uncontrollable seizures. She was unable to move and she was in a wheelchair. But she lived to the age of eight. You know, she passed away in uh, 2017, but she was happy. To us, that's a really important thing. We weren't putting her through unnecessary tests and things like that. So when you're taking part in a, in a clinical study, it's important that's also taken into consideration. If you take part in a study, you don't want it to be a huge burden on the patient or the patient's family. And this, this kind of goes back to that collaborative approach. Relevance is all a matter of perspective. What's important to the patients may actually not be that important to pharma or to the clinicians or even to the patient groups. What we have to do is come around the consensus that what you're developing will impact all those different groups. And then this is the most important bit when you have your idea, you have to nurture it and make it grow. Bringing you all together to develop something that can make a difference is really, really important. And you should all be taking stock of that as you, as you develop the idea and realize it and the impact it can have on your community. And this is, a, this is more on the, on the tech, kind of digital side. I think this is really important. What we've seen in the last you know, 12 months or so with COVID is that everyone is at home. You know? We are no longer going into the hospital for routine checkups. We're doing lots of things remotely. And actually, this has helped a lot of uh, pharma companies, researchers, start to look at things in a different way. A traditional way of any clinical study is you go in for your first test, and three months, six months later, you're retested again on what particular PROM or PRO you're looking at. But all you're seeing is a snapshot. You're not seeing the actual impact the disease has on an individual over a longer period of time. What we can do, and we can strive and make change, we can show the patient experience of any pro or problem that we develop, which I'll show you an example very shortly of an effectively developing a standardized test to make it something very different. We can, what we're able to do is show the impact of disease over a period of time. And what it shows is that the impact of the disease on, on individuals is different. And in fact, we all know this because we were all part of the Razies community, but the disease impacts everyone in a very different way. And during the day, or during the week or during months, you have good days and you have bad days. And what we need to do is show that in any, any pro or prom that's, that's developed, it needs to be effective to show the impact of a disease, not just on a snapshot of when you're in the clinic. Again, I go back to first experience with Emily. When we took her into hospital, she was always, always very tense. And the doctor's always been, you know, she's not doing so well at the moment, is she? And in fact, she was absolutely fine at home. It was the fact she was in a hospital setting. What we can do is do this stuff from the home. You develop a pro or a prom that can be recorded in the home setting. You get much better data. You also get information that shows a true impact of the disease as someone is in that natural setting where they feel comfortable. They're not performing, doing, for example, a peg hole test. They're actually just in their natural environment and how they, how they respond to things. And I think that's a really important, especially when we develop these, these pros and proms. And what it does is it also puts the focus on the patient and you get really clear um, and efficient evidence. And that's, again, the most important thing. And this is what pharma companies are starting to see, that we can develop these things with patient groups and patients that can give them high quality data that can actually show the impact of the disease. Because at the end of the day, that's the information they need when they are developing these things. And I'll take you back to that step. I, the goal for all of us, is a treatment that's why it's up there with the trophy we all want treatments but there are steps along the way and to me the first step is identifying that appropriate prom pro co or whatever you're going to be using it's very important to identify that at the very very beginning because as i mentioned before there'll be nothing worse than a study failing just because people can't do the outcome measure that's been selected as part of the study and what we have to do as patient groups is help that process and ensure we can develop something and make a difference. Now, I'm going to talk to you very briefly about an example of a um, standard test that's done in a clinic with the timed up and go. So the timed up and go test is where someone sits in a chair, gets up, walks about three meters, turns around, sits back down, and that test is timed, and that's it. So you can be in a clinic, time someone, you know, they're on a treatment, see how long it takes, and if it takes them longer, you assume they're doing worse. If it takes them quicker, you assume they're doing better. The, the actual test itself, you can, and we can, as a community, ask for more. We can drive that sort of test further. And in fact, the way technology is advanced, 
we now have the capabilities. I mean, everyone has a smartphone to record ourselves doing these tests. Here's an example of someone doing the time back and go. This individual, young lady, she gets up. And what you're seeing here, it's a performer in the task, but actually the information you get is much more in depth. You're not just getting the time it takes her to walk. You're actually getting the effort it takes for her to get up from the chair. And this gentleman as well, you're getting his gait, his swing, you're getting more information about the disease itself. And in fact, it's gonna enable you as a, as a group to get more information, to look at the impact it has on the individual and any treatment they're on, actually the impact it has there as well. And you can take this even further. We start looking at uh, different measurements, able to toe alignment. All of this information can be collected. And the reason I'm showing you this is because this can be done in the home setting. These are traditional clinical assessments done in clinic where the patient is nervous. They're on a slippery hospital floor. It's cold. If it's a child, it's intimidating. And in fact, you can just do this in the home setting. It can be recorded and it can be used in any sort of software to analyze that information. And in fact, you can then look at variation in individuals. Here you can see these two individuals have different walking types. They walk in different ways. One has a big arm swing, one doesn't. But then you can baseline that information against them, against themselves. And then you're using that information to look at the impact of treatments over a period of time. What is possible here is to essentially develop a classic clinical assessment into something that's new, innovative, and in this case, can show the impact of the disease. This is an example that can be used in, in Parkinson's. It can be used in uh, Tay-Sachs disease and the juvenile form, in juvenile forms of Neem and Pick Gaucho disease. And you, the information you can get from this is massive because you can then start looking at different ways and different impacts treatments have on the individual. And we, we can continue going through in terms of how we develop these endpoints, but the most important point is to ask the community. They're the ones who can help guide you and shape you and understanding what's important. So in terms of, of GM2, uh, taste access handle, for us, it's really important for us to develop endpoints that meet the needs of the three populations. We have infantile, juvenile, and late onset. They're very different in terms of the disease impact, but what are we gonna be looking at in the infantile form is very different to the juvenile form. And what we need to know is what's important for the patient. We can't be the person sitting there who has no understanding of the disease, no understanding of what we want to achieve. We need to be, as a patient group, stand up and say, this, in terms of symptom, can we do something to control seizures? That's what we should be looking at, seizure frequency, because that's actually gonna make a difference to someone's quality of life. And these are where we can start developing things that are innovative and new, and they can make a big impact uh, to our people. So I think I'll stop there for the first set of questions. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. That's, yeah, super, so we can see faces. <laughs> super. Um, so we have we have one question, uh, actually, for you, Daniel. Um, and where, question? Sorry? To get my question, this is Ines. Yes, it's your, it's your question. <laughs> so uh, just, uh, um, uh, Go ahead. Life. So it's a terminology question. Um, for you, what's the difference between a prom and a pro? And also, can you put an example of a clinical outcome um, assessment um, so that, because there was also a question of what uh, COAs were. So can you put also an example? So back to terminology, the basics. Yeah, yeah, no. So the, the terminology is something that people still kind of alternate through between proms and pros as being the same thing. And it's kind of like patient reported outcome, which is what the patient reports versus the outcome measure. So the outcome measure is the, is the clinical assessment that you're, you're providing. So it's kind of some interchangeable phrases and there is no clear terminology. This is what we're getting into, especially with, with, when we start throwing EPROs and e, e, EPROMs, is do we have a standardized terminology? We don't, unfortunately. And when we're looking at the pros, the patient reported outcome, it's kind of like the group of doing a task and what the actual out the prom is so the patient body outcome measures particular measure that's, that's been developed and used we tend to use pros just because it's talking about it in general and then the clinical outcome assessment is the what's done in the clinic and what the what the assessment will be and then the ECOA is then how you can do that dig, virtually or digitally and again that's terminology that's advancing constantly and all the time and so we're seeing this change you know from 
from years ago, these phrases never existed. Now, now they're all the, the hot topics. You'll be invited to many presentations about it, but you'll see the terminology is kind of interchangeable. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Thank you, Daniel. Any other question or comment? Or, yeah, there is a question from Stefano. Do you think that the use of technology in prompts will replace the use of the whole questionnaire? So, yes, I, we'll, we'll touch on it in the next half of, of the, uh, the presentation, but for sure. Think about it in terms of, um, do you need to go into hospital to complete a questionnaire? No. So what do they do? They may send you a questionnaire to complete, but they can't guarantee you'll, you'll complete the questionnaire. So by the development of these prompts and doing them digitally as well, you can actually force people essentially to complete things. You can give them reminders and triggers. So no longer you need to worry about bringing people into a clinic and giving them a pen and paper and sit over them while you watch them complete. You can track, their, track them doing these things uh, virtually. And what that does is you can then look at adherence. What we, what we are trying to do is we want to make sure that people adhere to study measures, okay? And so the, the, big, um, the big issue actually has always been, how can you guarantee people will take part in a study and keep, 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 complete their assessments from the home setting? However, and this is me talking as perspective as a, as a parent, being involved and have the responsibility is something I would enjoy because I know I would be taking control of my daughter's healthcare. I'd be excited to be trusted that I, we as a family are involved in developing treatments for her disease in her community. And that's that level of trust. And that's why that collaborative approach is really important and why, and why patients need to be bring, brought into that conversation. Because we as patients or parents, carers, we need to also be on board. We need to be involved in everything to understand why we're doing it. So rather than go into a clinic and say, get up from that chair, walk there, walk back, great, you can go home. You actually explained, right, I want you to get up from this chair because I want to look at the way you're walking. Does your gait change at a period of time? Is it because the disease is progressing? Why? And explaining this information, then the patient feels much more empowered. And we're all talking, and everyone's talking about patient empowerment, how it's really, really important. These are really useful ways of doing it by having the patients involved in the development of problems and pros and understanding why they're being asked to complete certain tasks. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. There is another question, I think, uh, from Platform CHD. I think it's from Frank, but I'm not sure. Um, can you give an example of the technology used for this? I think, I mean, it was for Stefano, but I don't know. I, I understand it's for Daniel. Otherwise, uh, please, you can unmute if you want to add anything, the person that will send the, the question. So I think, so Daniel, you, yeah, you can go ahead maybe, thanks. So are there's, there are different, different companies out there. So I work for an organization that does uh, mobile uh, technology for, for endpoints. So you'd use it with mobile applications, with wearable devices. There are lots of different companies out there who do this, but the important thing is about once you record the information, how is it used? And actually, the, that's the big step. Recording stuff is actually relatively straightforward because as, as I showed you before, those videos were of patients doing a simple task at home, just in the garden. I can go and do that now with, with the kids. But actually, once it's uploaded, is where the technical things happen. Is it all held, data held safely and securely? Do you adhere to certain ISO standards? Um, there's so much around it. Then it's overlaying machine learning and stuff. And that's where the very interesting work is done. And that's where specific technology is used. And there are many examples out there who, who are looking into this kind of sort of technology because we're, we're now all seeing this benefit of doing it from the home setting. And actually you can reduce burden on patients. People don't need to come to the clinic to do a task like that. You can do it at home. And how much easier is it? I was saying an example earlier was that we used to take my daughter, I live in London. So for me to get to my daughter's hospital, used to take us you know, 45 minutes on the train. Uh, then you'd have another 20 minute walk. Then you go into the clinic, you're seen by the doctor. Then you come back, it's exhausting because she needs to be suctioned all the time. 
she'd have seizures, her feeding. So, you know, I'd have to take a day off work. But then we got to an agreement uh, with her doctors near the very end, it was just to do her appointments via Skype because we weren't really doing anything major with her assessment wise. We did it from Skype. I could do that before work. Everyone was happier. She was happier because she wasn't being taken out of the house on a long journey. My wife was happier because we didn't need to worry about organizing the other kids out. And then she could actually work from home and I could just go to work once it was done. So this, this kind of shift to doing things at home is a mentality we're all now seeing. And the impact on the patient is so great. This is what it should be. Can I, can I uh, ask uh, the next question? I'm, I'm sorry, I, uh, I'm on my phone, so I cannot uh, uh, type uh, directly. Uh, but uh, you mentioned in your presentation that you have an important role for the pharma companies too. Uh, but mm. uh, in my experience, a lot of uh, 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 research projects fail uh, because pharma has a hand of choosing exactly the wrong parameters mm -hmm. uh, to score. Yeah. Uh, isn't yeah. it a, a better idea that uh, patients and uh, uh, specialists, medical specialists, uh, firstly uh, work on uh, specific drafts, prompts uh, to put forward uh, for, uh, for uh, testing uh, pharmaceutical products? So from my own personal experience, I've worked with different organizations, big pharma, small pharma, and I've always found them to be very collaborative in what you're trying to achieve. But again, it depends on the, on the company. When I, I talk of the Hercules model earlier, which is really different in that they have multi-stakeholders from different pharma companies, different patient groups and patients and researchers. And what they've been able to achieve as a group is really interesting is developing these endpoints for the Duchenne community, which they're all in agreement with. And their view on it is if they're all in that process, then they'll select an endpoint or a pro or a prom that they will happily use in a clinical study. At the end of the day, pharma will fund a project or a study that they're interested in. And so they won't want to be dictated to, they want to be part of that process. And from my, my, again, my experience is that they're happy to be involved in that. It's all about collaborating together. That's why, you know, I, to me, the heart of it is everyone is important as each other there's no one group is more important than the other because we all bring in totally different things to the table farmers bring in the money at the end of the day to get the trial going patient groups we are that conduit between pharma researchers and patients patients are vital because with no patients there's no patient group there's no clinicians there's no pharma and the clinicians obviously are, do, are running the study and then that that kind of intellectual knowledge they bring about the disease and I think once everyone's aware that you all have different skills that can actually impact the study or impact the development of something like this, it's important. And I think it's all education. And I think pharma is getting much more aware that they need to listen to patient groups and they need to listen to, to patients. And I think that in the next five years, that's going to change drastically. I think there's going to be more and more patient involvement. I think pharma companies are going to have advisory boards, a general advisory boards, disease specific advisory boards, helping them develop things. And I think that, that as long as that goes on, it, the better it is. Uh, there is a comment, uh, thank you, uh, Daniel. There is a comment from uh, Madeleine, but for the endpoints, also regulators like the European Medicine Agency are relevant, aren't they? They also describe which endpoints a study should contain. Or, or, or I am wrong. That's, uh... <laughs> so the regulators to, to me need to, I think they've been slower at responding to our involvement as patient groups than, than pharma. I think pharma have recognized that patient groups do have a very important part to play. And I think the regulators need to see that as well. And that when we are describing the disease and what's important to the community, they were saying that from experience. And I think they, they're the ones sometimes you can slow that entire process up. Because if you go to the pharma company and they say, at the end point we want to look at, let me just say this in, in, in Tay-Sachs, for example, is we're going to give a drug that charge and live longer. 
I'm going to say, well, living longer doesn't necessarily mean a great thing because the child can have multi disabilities, have low quality of life. Let's look at can the drug you want to do, let's just for an example, reduce seizures. I am not saying that without well the, the breadth of, of experience that we all have about the disease. And then the regulators need to understand that when we advise the pharma companies, they're taking the advice from us. This isn't the pharma company then saying, this is the endpoint we're using. They have done their research and they've done their work with patient groups and patients, got advisory boards together to help them develop or come up with an endpoint to use. And sometimes they get asked very difficult questions and they, they then come to us as patient groups and say, but the regulator said, this isn't a great idea. And then you're caught in this battle about how do we go to regulator with the company to argue the case of that trial design? Because we can't have the study fail because of that trial design. I get an example, one of the studies we're involved in is we went initially on a very simple drug study to reduce impact of disease. Um, they wanted to do a double blind placebo trial. And I, the advisory board, we all said, well, these are dying people. You can't put someone in out of a placebo who's dying. The company very bravely decided, you're right, we can't. And we went back to the regulators and presented the case why it shouldn't be a placebo trial. And they agreed. But we're given that advice from our experience, knowing full well that our patient community wouldn't take part in a study out of placebo arm. They just wouldn't because the risk is too high to those patients who'd have low, re low recruitment and the study would fail. And that's why it's so important that regulators also listen, that when the pharma are bringing things to discuss, it's from the um, experience of the patients that they brought in, who are involved in the study. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, um, there is also a, a, a question, comment and question from uh, Jose um, asking about, so how to ensure actually that the information and observation are comparable. So most of the information is given by parents or caregivers. And so unless every person who does the observing uh, or giving the information are using exactly the same measurements, um, then you get kind of unified results or unified uh, information. But what happens if someone, you know, see a completely different sign in the child or symptoms or, or, or has a different um, let's say, um, analysis or, you know, or describe something which is, yes, different from, uh, from his or her perspective. So on that one, if you're looking at, at, at videos, this is the, this has been the way that in some clinical studies it's done where you have the endpoint recorded and then it's scored and then you have, you have, um, independent reviewers scoring the videos. So to me, what's really interesting, and some of the studies I've been involved in, is actually looking at what the and looking at pediat in children, is what the parent thinks versus actually to what the clinician thinks. And sometimes it's completely different. But that information is very important as well because it's all about perspective. I, I was going to touch on it earlier, but um, there's a, a friend of mine. She suffers from PCD, and. Um, we're talking about quality of life and she was saying that pain is a very difficult thing for us because I'm, I'm always in pain. So if you said to me, how's my pain today? It's zero. But for everyone else, it'd probably be a three or four. I have pain all the time. But it's, that is really important to, to understand that thing, things vary between the patient, parent, carer, then to the, uh, to the clinicians who can compare those two. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, do you, I, I saw there are some questions about the uh, the involvement. Uh, uh, I mean, related to the ERNs. This is the second part of the of the actually of the presentation. So um, before we go back to this, I don't know if you if you want to add to ask anything else to Dan or or to share also any things and experience. We have a comment now from uh, Anne Hugon, and I don't know if you. Maybe I can, yeah. I can, uh, do you want to take the floor or? No, yes, I, I yes. Hello, Daniel. Yeah, in case of clinical study, all those uh, practitioners, all those clinicians will react with your, uh, the, the measurement you bring to them. 
in an academic positively. format? No, positively. I mean, we've, uh, in terms of where I work, we've done things which has been digitizing the, like the SARA, so the scale of rating attacks here. We've done something called the SARA home, which is taking five of the eight domains and measuring, measuring them in the home setting. And it actually validated that, that we've done a paper about it. We can get really good accurate measurements and the impact of a disease based on the SARA scale. And they're very keen to, to start doing this stuff in the home setting because they can also see the impact mm. on the patient. So you do, you do build to scale with them? We get, yeah, we used um, the SARA home and we called it SARA, SARA, and we called it SARA home, which was taking five of the domains of the, the SARA scale. And, uh, and we've been able to validate it in terms of what's been recorded with, with um, videos, the speech and things like that. So it's, it's entirely possible. And, and with our doctors and the doctors I've worked with, they've all been very receptive, this idea of recording from home. Also, they get 24 hour real time data. So you can be sitting rather than wait for the clinic visits, then to have to manually input data. You can look at it straight away. You could, you know, mm -hmm. at four o'clock in the afternoon, you have all the data from all your patients. Continual analysis can happen and you can actually see if a patient's at risk and things like that very quickly. Um, and so that's been the big difference. Okay, thank you. Mm. We can take another. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> That's nice. Um, we can take another question if you want to, or if you would like to share uh, your comment, your experience. Sorry. Uh, may hi. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> I have noticed on your website, uh, Daniel, that you have a pump. Uh, you have different type of uh, syndromes and disease, rare disease, and uh, you have the pump. So I belong to the glycogen storage disease families, and um, I would be very interesting to know and what what are you? Uh, how do you use all those um, information, and how do you how how is your organization can live on? So how do you manage to work and um, share all that? I don't know if I'm, um, <laughs> if it's can, well, it's confusing I, in here because it would be different questions. Yeah. I, can, I can send that to you. We can have a chat afterwards if you want mm -hmm. about that in terms of how we do it. Maybe that's better rather than just go specifically yes, on. We are too many. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. So, Okay, super. So maybe we can continue, Daniel, with the second part of the of the presentation, of the session, which is actually what can ERN do in the area of uh, quality of yeah. life measurements. Thank you very much. So, uh, I'll continue. So what can we do in the area of quality of life? So quality of life. I, I was obviously preparing the slides for this and I found this paper actually from from 20 years ago which I think is quite interesting to see that things haven't really changed from 20 years ago when we we're talking about quality of life and what it's determined by so it's the extent to which hopes and expectations are matched by experience individual per perceptions the current state and what people regard as important in their lives and this is really important when we look at quality of life because we need to develop quality of life measurements that are impactful for our community. So what we're trying to look at is not doing, creating something that is generic, but something that's specific. And I, I mentioned earlier about my friend with, with, with PCD, and she was involved with the development of the PCD quality of life. And pain was a really big question that came up because they have, um, they have pain all the time. And so when the kids report pain, the kids report pain as zero or one to their parents, but then the parents observing when they do the care of form of the quality of life report the pain of five because the parents are seeing their kids in pain. So what we have to do is make sure we develop these things which are specific. So asking that pain question is interesting, but you're not going to get a true reflection of pain other than the individual. So it kind of flows into this, you know, what does it show? Does it simply describe patient's health in terms of what health professionals want, or does it actually capture the patient perspective? And this is the really, really important bit when we develop these things, because we really want to capture this, the patient perspective, because that information can be used effectively. Whereas just describing what healthcare professionals want, 
isn't really that interesting because you're just going to get something very generic. You want something specific for the disease. We suffer from it in, in Tay-Sachs. And actually, we've had to borrow in earlier studies SMA's uh, quality of life questionnaire because it sort of fitted our community. It doesn't really. But we haven't had the opportunity because we haven't had the studies to actually develop our own quality of life measure or our quality of life uh, questionnaire, which we are now in the process of doing. And that tool itself will be very powerful because that's something that can then be used across the different studies. What we want to move away from is just borrowing other people's um, measurements. We want something that's specific. When we talk about developing pros and problems for our disease, it needs to meet the needs of our community. And it's the same here with the quality of life measurements. Every disease is different. So we need to reflect that in the data we capture. And then it's kind of what you're asking. Disease specific, has to be very patient centric, has to have a range of questions, has to be innovative. And I think this is the really, really uh, important bit in that let's not just ask the standard, how are you today kind of questions. Let's be innovative, think about the disease. You know, we know if we're looking at Tay-Sachs, for example, that the children have seizures. So we're doing a care of quality of life. Is the impact of seizures, is, is it impact in terms of someone's daily living? We need to ask other variety of, of seizures. We need to ask things which are actually going to really shed a light on the disease rather than did they have seizures. So we need to be very, very kind of innovative in our, in our kind of question design. And what we want to do is paint a picture, kind of build a picture. Asking the patient and the patient groups is so important because we can then create that message. And what you're doing really in equality of life is you're building a picture and creating a message about the disease to find a solution. Because the solution from the, from the quality of life is to know is, there a high, is the quality of life okay or is it not? And if it's not, what we can do to impact it. But the questions you're asking to create that message are vital. And that's why you go back to the patient. The patient is so important in helping us develop that because they know the disease, they know the impact, they know what people should be asking. And we need to bring them together to do that. And this is exactly what they did with, um, with the Hercules model, which was to bring everyone together. And they ended up working off like five different domains and how they're going to go into developing their quality of life questionnaire. And it's shown so much more about the disease. So I was just going to show you a very quick example of. Um, Call it just a, a simple health questionnaire. So this is the EQ5D. Some of you may have heard it. Five questions and then a health scale. As done in the clinic or it's posted out to you. Simple. So many different studies will use this just as a kind of, you know, secondary endpoint or something. But the way we've all shifted now and how we, we interact, we don't do things pen and paper anymore. Things have moved on. And in fact, things have changed. So since I entered this world, which was actually 10 years ago, 10 years ago in March when Amelie was diagnosed with Tay-Sachs disease in 2011, everything was done on paper. I think you know, the iPads were around, I think, back then, but they weren't very good. Every, the doctors were still handwriting all of their notes and then give the secretary to input into the system. But technology has moved on so much. Social media has moved on so much. And our expectations as a consumer have improved in that we expect things to be done quicker and easier. And paper questionnaires have fallen afoul to this. Paper is now digital. You go into the hospital, you go into the, in our case, the GPs, everything's done off a tablet, off the computer. You don't ever write anything down. If you're asked to do a questionnaire, they just, you know, they'll send it to you by email or by a tablet and you complete it. And what we're now seeing is this shift is being much more inclusive. So people who couldn't complete these sorts of things earlier are now able to do so. So this is an example of how you can digitize a very simple quality of life questionnaire. Okay, and again, this looks simple. In terms of development and getting all the stakeholders involved was actually quite complex. But the ability to answer this sort of thing from a tablet or from your mobile device is massive because you can do it from the home setting. You can be sent this however many times by your doctor or by your clinician. You don't need to have it posted. 
then you don't need to have that weight of someone filling in by hand then someone having to input that data into a system and then waiting for everyone to complete it to then run the analysis you can send this out to, to 100 people to complete 50 do it straight away 50 don't you can send them a reminder to do it and they can keep reminding them every day until they complete it then you can analyze it straight away there's no delay there's no burden on the patient to come into a clinic or for you to cost to, to, to send out a questionnaire in this example, it can be done very, very quickly. And this is what we all want. We all want to reduce burden on patients. We want to reduce burden on clinicians. We want something specific for our disease. This sort of advancement is, is helping us get there. So when I, we look at kind of developing these things, it's not a simple process. You have to be really open-minded in any approach you take because what you want to do is you want to develop something that is disease-specific at the end of the day that your community will get a big impact from. And in terms of developing this, you need to work as a team. It's the patients. I take it back the patients, the patient groups, pharma, the clinicians. It's everyone to help you make something disease-specific. And you can make a difference. And I think if you all get the patient force change in your community. And you develop a tool like this, you know, a disease specific quality of life that can be done in the home setting. You can start using this when you go out to farm and you go out to people to talk about developing treatments that you already have these things built ready to use. All of a sudden you become a much more attractive proposition to, to the companies developing treatments because you have things set up. And that's the biggest change I've noticed in the last kind of like five years is the discussions with pharma and not biotech companies when they have a potential, like a small molecule treatment, is how engaged is your community? What have you done before? They want to know, do you have these, these sorts of things already set up? Can you reach out? Do you have a patient registry? Do you have access to people who would take part in a study? And this sort of tool, having a, a disease specific quality of life measure, be it a questionnaire, be it another as a particular endpoint is massive because it makes you very very attractive to people to develop treatments so that's um answering that question thank you very much daniel any any question that would be interesting now to hear your experience a little bit what if you have been involved if you are involved in your NERN, developing any outcome measures or if you would like to do it and you don't know how to do that so a little bit to exchange your views your experience have you been involved or not would you like how to do that yes yeah, go ahead oh marjolaine alex yeah hello hi um does uh daniel know about grid project and chris bundy No, I think um, because I, I can I will share a link with you because there's a, a global project going on, including these kind of things and has already been discussed in Milan in 2019 by the Global Skin Foundation. So I think there can be a lot of sharing knowledge and experience at this level, making life much easier. I will, I will put a link in the in the chat so we have some more details. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. I just take the chance, but uh, Marjolaine, it's really up to you, eh? because at the beginning, I just I was introducing, uh, saying that you know some of you have experience in in this area, and you kindly sent us yesterday a link to a publication that you did recently with the clinicians. Uh, so I don't know if you would like to um, to share a little bit with the others. Yeah, that, that was my link. Um, the GRID project is on all skin diseases, and I um, I participated in uh, patient reported outcome measures for uh, CMN, which is the large congenital nevi. And to get um, so it was initiated by the hospital, and then we I contributed by getting in touch with all the people, and we organized um, a few meetings uh, in person which we could accidentally do because we had a an international meeting and that was a good chance to talk 
uh, how do you call it? That, that was the Delphi study, I think they call it. Like when you talk to each other and determine what are the important um, measures you want to be measured. And then we uh, gave out these, uh, how do you call them? Okay. Enquête? Surveys. Surveys, that's it. Then we, we had these surveys uh, online and we tried to connect as many to, to as many people as possible. So that, that's how it was done. And then they uh, made a publication out of it and it was accepted for the British Journal of Dermatology, which was really good. Yeah, congratulations on that. Would, you, would it be possible to send us the link? I don't know if that's uh, the link to the publication. Yes. I can do that. It's open source. But yeah. it's probably a paid article and we don't have access. It's not open source. It. Okay. But maybe okay. you have it. I don't know if you have access, access to it. Okay, we can we can take a look at it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Marjolaine. There is another um another question on the chat. Well, do you have any questions, sorry, to Marjolaine first? I don't see any hand. I'm sorry, that was a question for me. No, I was asking the participants, but I don't think there is uh, any questions. Okay, there is, an, there is a question from in the chat from Karen. Uh, she says that for diseases that are very slowly progressing, developing pro or quality of life is very difficult, despite having registries and collaboration with pharma and clinicians. So the question is, have you developed anything for slowly progressing conditions? And yeah. I suppose the question is for you, Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 we have actually. And what one of the, the ways we've, we've done it quite well is to um, use kind of proof of concept. So rather than try and roll an idea out to a huge group number of people, maybe do it with five or 10 people just to test and to see actually our is the idea that's being proposed meeting the needs of the patient population again what we may think is a great idea even us as patient groups may not actually be the best when it goes out to patients we may find that we're asking the wrong questions or asking them to do the wrong task and the feedback is negative so to do it that way what you're able to do is develop it and see if patients are willing to, to, to complete the pro or the quality of life and if you're asking the right thing and then from there, you can start developing it further on based on feedback. And we've done that with a few groups in the past and a few diseases and actually been very successful because information we've got um, has shown sometimes we were going the wrong way in terms of what we we're asking. So we're able to kind of realign and move forward with a, with a kind of modified idea, which is really important as well. And just on that point, it's never a bad thing if what you're looking at doesn't work. You need to learn from it. What you can't do is keep repeating the same mistake. So if that particular pro didn't work, there will be a specific reason why. I need to learn from it. And actually that learning can then be used with another company, maybe in the future, you want to be looking at a similar sort of endpoint. So look, it doesn't work in our community because we've tried it. And that learning can then be shared with, um, with other people. I think that's a really important that failure isn't necessarily the end. It's important that you learn from things that don't work. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, any other question? I see um, a comment from Ruth. Maybe Marjolaine can share an email address. <laughs> that would be interesting because we are planning a Delphi study in Garhart, as well as after our PROMS workshop. So I, 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 I leave you both to Ruth. If you need, um, if you need any, if you need an email address or someone, you can ask. You can ask us or uh, as you prefer, Marjolaine. Uh, Ines, you, you had a question to Daniel. Maybe we can take it now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my question is, you were insisting a lot, and I understand why, on disease-specific measures. And uh, you were explaining that um, they used to um, use SMA uh, endpoints for your for um, the disease uh, of, of your daughter, and that it didn't quite work. But yeah. for the year... It, it, Let's um, go back to the ERNs and the fact that they are grouping diseases that share some commonalities. Is there a way or would, there, would you envisage 
um, maybe not developing the same prompt for um, you know um, different diseases, but um, working together um, and maybe um, uh, benefiting from the fact that there are some commonalities and mm -hmm. and being faster like that and, and going a little yeah. bit faster. This is mm -hmm. yeah. Can you? Yeah, yeah, of course. So this is this is really interesting and actually something we've looked at not just not. Um, for endpoints I've looked at for GM, for TASACs with LSDs in the UK. So we're part of uh, the LSD collaborative. And one thing we've talked about is when we look at the registries, the diseases are all the same, but different, but there are commonalities. And actually standardizing the questions we're going to ask is really important. And then changing them slightly on the nuances of the disease themselves. And that's, that's, is a very effective way to, to develop these things because then you can have a collective group developing something that then slightly differs, but you can actually bring all the questions back together. They're asking the same thing, but they're just slightly specific on the disease. It's really important. And then the power of numbers, again, these things are much easier to then get approved if you have more people joining you um, in developing them. So again, it's all about the grouping, the grouping of the diseases within the group. So for us, a metabolic disorder, a nice number of storage disease, and then GM2. And then GM2 is actually Tay-Sachs and Sanoff disease. Two diseases, one's hexamidose A, one's a lack of deficiency, one's a lack of deficiency in hexamidose A and B. But actually we group those two together as GM2, although they're different diseases, and then as an LSD. So yes, if you work together on, on designing and developing measures that are similar, you can actually make a big difference there because it can be specific disease. SMA isn't GM2. That's the point. It's, there is no real similarity. Yes, the children die young, but you know that's kind of where it ends. It's it's different. But if it, we've we've used another one, we've used this NPC. We've used their normal pick um, measures before quite effectively because it's much more similar. But it's making sure if you are going to use similar ones that are along the same line in terms of disease progression. Okay, thanks for that, Daniel. Any other question? Or comment? There is a comment from Tina that's a positive one that <laughs> uh, failure is always not a bad message. So never ignore some new facts you develop by failure. And uh, yeah, as Dan said, it's always always good and we learn, even we learn from, from mistakes and uh, and we should move on. So that's um, that's a yeah a great message. So uh, just actually ju just on that point, there there was actually years ago a treatment attempted or stem cell uh, therapy for for Tay Sachs disease which failed completely, didn't work. But they never wrote the results up for kind of ten years on the study, and the problem was when we started up the Katz Foundation, everyone was talking about stem cell. And we were like, well, we've been told the therapy doesn't work, but no one had the proof. And not, the point there is if things fail, you need to share those results and the reasons why it didn't work so people can learn. So you're not say, making the same mistake time and time again. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. There is another question from uh, Caroline. For you, Daniel, did you make um, the questionnaire fair? Um, uh, so that the information in, in the database can be found by all the researchers. So fair meaning, uh, you know, um, the data meaning, um, sorry, accessible, inter in interoperable, and there is, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> missing one of the letters, but you know, you know where I'm <laughs> visible and I'm missing that R. Findable, accessible, yeah. interoperable, and oh. <laughs> reproductible. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So in the example I showed you, that's the uh, EQ5 of Miracle. So what we did was we digitized that questionnaire based upon the guidance they give, but that the, the results from the system itself can be integrated into anything very easily. But we, we didn't develop the actual questionnaire. What we did, we just made it into a digital form that can be implemented into different clinical studies. But did you only make it digital or did you also make it uh, machine readable so that the ontology uh, 
translate your questions into machine readable data to make your database fair? Yeah, it's all done within the, the back end of our system. So that's the a question about the company. But in terms of our, our data, it then feeds into all the systems to then be analyzed according to the scoring of how the EQ5D is done. But that's the technicalities of how the system collects, stores, and processes data. And that's for my tech team who, who, who deal with all of that. Yeah, because this is, of course, a very interesting development, uh, this uh, FAIR uh, technology. And also at Veskern, we have also, like Mario Lane said, via the Delphi study in uh, 20, 2016, also for Veskern, for vascular anomalies, uh, uh, these uh, outcome domains were, um, were set up. And now uh, with the questionnaires that uh, also were made for vascular anomalies, they are now also, the, also in the process of being in the verification, so to speak, uh, process that we can use it in all different kinds of studies. And for example, now we are working at the Share for Rare project in, in Barcelona. And of course, you might heard of it. It's uh, the, the input in that pro project is coming from the patient. So patient reported uh, outcome and they do it by symptoms. So they report their symptoms in this system. And now it was uh, set up for cancer. And now we're uh, with our Vescurn um, chairs, we're trying to make also uh, this accessible for vascular anomaly patients uh, with FAIR questionnaires. <laughs> and then the idea is that in a few years time, um, patients can find each other uh, via this uh, FAIR system. So there's a lot going on uh, in, in many ERNs like I, I read and heard now. That's very, very good to hear. Any other comments or <clears throat> a question? I see another one from the chat. Um, what about the role of clinicians in patient reported outcome measures? I think it's, uh, yeah. Are you there? Uh, yeah, no, they're very important, obviously, and they should always be in that that discussion, leading what's what's actually viable to be done, if it's done in the clinic or if it's done at home, and what type of data that can be collected and how it's collected. And I think, obviously, their expertise and understanding the disease is really important as well. So, again, it's, it's highlighting everyone's um, expertise and what they can bring to the table. It's very important. I think gone are the days where we all went to the doctor and when the doctor said, this is what's happening, that doesn't happen anymore. And they've got much better when you, as a patient or patient group, give your opinion. And it's the same with the development of the, of the problems. A clinician will say what's a viable um, option for what you want to develop for the clinical or the, or the at-home setting. Um, and they should obviously be involved in the entire process. But their role, it's just as important as patients, just as important as patient groups, and just as important as as um, as a farmer. And and I keep going on about the same thing, but it's the collaborative approach. We all have something we can which can drive this forward, and we should all be on this on the level playing field. It shouldn't be one group is much more important than the other because then you get an imbalance. Thank you, Dan. There is another question, which is actually related to uh, what Ines was asking to you, Dan, um, from Jose. Would it be possible for the ERNs to develop a template from a, a PROM, uh, obviously being able to be adapted for each disease? So I don't know. Um, yeah, maybe, I don't know hmm. if, you, yeah, if you want to add. Oh, for sure. Something. So the, so the timed up and go, that's a perfect example of, of an outcome measure that can be adapted for uh from multiple diseases but what is the information is extracted so it could be that it one group is actually more interested in understanding if someone's a uh, hill walking or toe walking or if someone is gait analysis is different but you'll be using the same measure it's just what element you're going to be extracting from it as how we did with the sara home so the sara home essentially is completing five tasks but you may only be interested in the speech aspect of it, 
or the nose to finger part of it and how that, that information is recorded. You can pick the domain, but the entire thing's called the SARA home. So it, that's entirely possible. And that's a really interesting way of looking at it, especially for a, a, a group of, the, of, of conditions because you can save time by developing it for, for maybe 10, 15, 20 diseases. And then you pick those elements which are important. And as long as they're validated in individually and collectively, then yeah, they can definitely be used. Thanks a lot for that. We still have a little, a little bit of time if you would like to, again, to ask anything else to Dan or, or share what you are doing or what you would like to do in your, in your group. Um, and you could share something on the chat. I don't know if you would like to, <clears throat> to comment on that. Uh, it's another kind of uh, collaboration between clinician and uh, families. So the Genita project is in front, it's on the anomaly, because I do belong to the Yoranitaka. And uh, this kind of uh, measurement also take care of the quality of life, not as, uh, as very, uh, you know, very thin measurement than you said with the scale you show us, but it gives on a rare disease because define the scale for each syndrome will take amount of time. So it will be huge work. So I'm not really sure that year ends with the small teams we are, are able to analyze, are able to realize for like for Itaka 5,000 of anomalies. So it's, it's uh, we can make by groups. So will Genida has defined, and that's why I just keep, the, I took this example, they define some core questions for all those type of genetic disease. So, you know, it's another possibility we could use uh, for patients. Thank you, Anne. Thanks for sharing this, that's good. Don't be shy. Huh? You can <laughs> you can ask. You can unmute yourself and uh, take advantage that we you are also all here. And uh, yes, Ines. <laughs> no, I don't because then I end up. So no, I was just. I think that what uh, um, Anne has just explained and what we were trying to uh, you know figure out here um, is this balance between the reality of ERNs and the and the resources that they have. The you know, number of uh, diseases, et cetera. And um, the, on the other side of the spectrum, the fact that we want something that is um, relevant for our diseases and that is as disease specific as possible. And there's this tension that, and I think it's very important that, that um, um, in the next year, I mean, in this year and the next couple of years, when I think that the ERNs will start more and more looking into this, that you um, engage with the clinicians and that you, what, what Dan was saying, that you're brave en enough to say, okay, this is very good to, to go for a common approach as much as possible and let's do it as much as possible. But that, that, that you speak up if you think that, that um, what's being developed is not going to work for your, for your disease area or your disease specific, um, I mean, your specific disease. And I think that, that we're going to see very interesting um, innovative approaches here. And I'm very, um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it actually, um, uh, because I do understand that that the clinicians and the ERNs and the project managers come with this view of let's do as much as possible um, things that are common, and let's be as efficient as possible with the resources that we have, and that's very good. But on the other hand, we want to have things, um, measures that can be used in clinical trials or in other type of research and that are relevant. Um, for us, so um, that's going to be very interesting, I think, um, in the years to come. Uh, maybe if I could add, I would say that maybe uh, things will be changed better in the in the years coming with a European Joint Program research on uh, and, and uh, human science. So maybe we'll we'll see the you know the scape changing uh, quite. And I can talk on as a project manager of a new and I can say that, but I also say that as a mom of a rare disease child. So I know how it's important it could be. 
I wanted to add that I don't think this would have been something I could have initiated. It, it was an initiative from the hospital and I joined in in the program, but it, it's, it's not just something small. It was such a huge project and there's, uh, there are medical students working on it and they are writing and they do the medical research which needs to be done in advance. And it was it was such a huge project um, that it's quite a big job. And I don't think I could have done it by myself or even initiated it by myself. It's it was just really working together with the clinicians and researchers. And Marjolaine, may I ask you, uh, how did you get approached? I mean, you 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 were you knew the clinicians, of course, I suppose, and they asked you to participate. Yes, and. Um, I'm running the international organization for Nevis, uh, for, for Nevi, and they wanted it to be an international publication. And I have a quite, I'm, I'm in touch with a lot of people. So they approached me to really get connected worldwide. Um, yeah, and that's how it started. So you were not the only one, of course, as a patient representative involved in this. No, no. But I'm in yeah. touch with all the national patient leaders. And by joining them, like I said, we had a conference too. So they came to the conference and uh, I organized an extra meeting there so we could talk to all the national me uh, leaders. And from there, it's like a network going on. And we just try to connect as many to as many people as possible, because uh, the more people who, who uh, support this uh, research, the more successful, the more likely it's going to be successful. Because the next step is we defined all these, um, uh, we, uh, we made all these definitions, like what to do in research and what to look at when someone is seen by a, a, a clinician or a particular practitioner um, but now it needs to be supported too by everyone so it's very important we had as many people included as possible thank you very much you send the link to the summary of the of the of the, of the yeah. article that yeah, you can find it on the chat if if i give you the number from the publication would that be enough for you to find it in the british journal of dermatology I never really look in there because I, I don't have access to the articles. I only can see the summary. But if I give that number, I can put it in the chat. I don't have the link to the article yet. OK, that would be great. Good. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Mm, anything else you would like to ask or to comment? There is just one thing coming from Antoine. Um, Antoine, I don't know if you would like to take the floor or you prefer me to read what you sure. said. We have time, so you can go ahead, Antoine. Okay. <laughs> I will just read my own question. Uh, I'm sorry I missed the beginning of the session, so I'm hoping I'm not asking something that was, uh, that was already addressed. So uh, I, I heard how much we, 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 uh, we mentioned, in, we insisted on the importance of having measures that are disease specific. Um, however, for many diseases, patients can be classified in, into subcategories of the disease, and this can even go uh, to the point where we actually consider every patient being a subcategory of the disease. Uh, maybe that doesn't apply to all diseases, but at least in my case, it does. Uh, anyway, uh, but the smaller the cohort of patients is, the more difficult it is to run any type of study. So the question, my question is, where do, where do we set the cursor between having measures that are specific, very specific uh, measures or, or questions, uh, or and um, sorry, questions that are uh, sorry, having questions that are not too specific, so that uh, the the cohort is big enough and we can actually run a study that leads to relevant conclusions. And, and I'm insisting on the fact that I'm particularly thinking about uh, questionnaires on quality of life. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the big problem. We, we, we have this, uh, the TAY-SACS community. So we have an infantile form, a juvenile form, and an adult form. So what's difficult for the juvenile form is it's neurodegenerative. So everyone ends up passing away very early and they lose ability to function independently. But the challenges the juvenile patients have are very different to the babies in that the juvenile may have issues with schooling that need to be addressed. Whereas the babies, it's all about seizures, 
losing ability to swallow and eat, while the adults is more about mobility than in losing independence. So what we're working on is developing quality of life that captures you depending where you're, you're classified. So we, well, there's no way we can look at a treatment uh, that kind of goes across all forms of disease. And that also comes down on, on rate of diagnosis. People are diagnosed at different times with different forms of the disease. And it's very difficult. And actually, sometimes yeah, I sometimes think that although we say it's the same disease, you know, that form is completely different to the, to the form of babies. It should really be its own disease. We actually have it set up at the charity. We have support workers, one for who's a specialist in dealing with the adults, one's a specialist in dealing with the baby, the babies, and one's a specialist in dealing with the kind of teenagers, just because the challenges are so different because the disease is so different, but obviously we group it together because it's the same lack of an enzyme in the brain. Whereas one group has more of that enzyme, one has less and one has none. But I agree, it's a challenge we, we all face. And that's why we were looking at this approach of being individual quality of life measures within that single disease. And then it gets very complicated. But when I look at the treatments, we're trying to match up to the treatments and all the treatments we're working on, some of the adults, some are for the, the juvenile cases and some are for the babies and it's disease progression. So we know that some treatments won't be effective on the, the younger cohort, while some will be much better for the adults. It's working out, can we match up with the data we collect within our patient registry and also in terms of developing um, quality of life. But not long answer to just say, I totally agree with you. And <laughs> it's a challenge we're all facing at the moment and it's difficult, it's very difficult. Okay. I mean, no, no solution. No easy to, to implement solution. I wish. I wish that there was a solution, if I'm honest. I, this is what we're going to all struggle with as well going forward. You know? I mean, again, we have it with our younger, our younger children. Even 10 years ago, we're dying at three. They're now living to age of five, six, or seven. So the health challenges are very different. So they're now posing a, a bigger challenge to... To healthcare systems and then also clinical studies where it used to be if your child was this age they could take part well we can't use age as that key kind of recruitment tool because disease progression and these kids they may be alive at seven or eight but they're completely reliant on care and previously they would have passed away earlier so it's making sure we change that terminology as well so it's a very difficult um uh, situation we're all in at the moment uh, it'll be interesting to know how we can we can get around it thanks thank you And uh, do we have time for another just a uh, brief thing? Because I see that we have Jess sure. with us. Aha! <laughs> yes. yes, Jess is a colleague of us. Um, she's our um, social research wizard and, uh, well, wizard, um, or witch, whatever you want. And um, so, We've been talking all the time about patient report outcome measures, Daniel, but there's these other set of measures that are also um, related to um, reported by patients, which are patient reported experience measures. And when we were preparing this call, I was um, discussing with you that, that we did see the possibility of um, developing something which was more um, horizontal and, and common across different diseases. Um, to measure the experience with um, the care received and with the health care received and the consultations, et cetera. And uh, Jesse is um, leading on, on this effort. Um, so a question for you is, what do you think about that? And, and a question for Jesse is, where do you think um, we have some challenges there? I think it's, it's very important because, again, it's it's perception isn't it so with the experience of their care needs to be effectively measured and I, again i don't think we we capture that sort of information that well so and, the, and what that can help us then do is develop better treatments better measures in terms of if you're taking part in a clinical study what should people should be measuring and separating those things out and getting that information is really important and i think we need to do more and more of that and I think that, the, again, the patient voice has become much more important than it used to be, is that we're all asking the questions, how was that for you? How are you doing? How, what's your experiences? And I think the more we do that, the better information we can get. And then, you know, we can start understanding the impact of the disease on an individual and, and, and groups and, and their experiences through the whole care pathway as well. 
And Jesse, what do you think are going to be the challenges to validate this for different diseases, this scale for different diseases? Yeah, the, the, the challenges would be the ones that you already uh, discussed, which are the number of people that we have to uh, have to validate the scale, because in that case, well, the easier, the easier thing with uh, patient experience measures is that to me, it seems to be easier to find common questions and common topics uh, that could be asked to several types of diseases. But at the same time, when, whenever you want to validate, so our goal as your this would be to validate it for everywhere diseases. Uh, but at the same time, we know that there may be some differences and that sometimes, uh, well, that, that people can also uh, use the skill and try to validate it for specific diseases or specific groups of diseases. And in that case, the difficulty is always to have enough respondents. And because you have to have within the, the current um, uh, scheme, and, and, and that's normal because it's just statistics, you have to have at least 300 respondents. Uh, so in the case of rare diseases, whenever your sample is uh, quite close to the general population, I mean, if, if you're trying to validate it for a disease for which you have 50 um, people represented and you have 45, then it, it, it's okay. But yeah, that, that, that would be the main challenge. If we're talking about earrings, for instance, and we want to validate something for a disease area that is for the whole ERN, then that's, that's quite complicated. Thanks. Thanks for that, Jesse. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I think unless you have any other questions or comments before we leave, I don't know. Uh, may I wrap up very quickly and just say yeah. thank you to Daniel really, because it's been really interesting and, and thanks for your time. And I, my takeaway from this session is what you, where you started actually with this um, four important things that we need to um, remind and, and have in our heads. Terminology that we're all talking about the same thing. The uh, understanding of the disease, it's important. Engagement, and this came up in the chat a little bit about the conflict of interests uh, being involved with pharma and in the ERNs. And I didn't want to go down that path because that's a huge one. But that's and the third, the e engagement thing, look at that also. And the collaborative approach. And I liked a lot what you said that there is uh, no one actor that is uh, more important that, than others and that we have to understand that. And what Marjolaine said was very you know clear reflection of that, that she couldn't have done that alone. So. <laughs> Let's uh, let's go together and, and let's be very clear about that. Um, we won't be able to do it without the others, um, the other actors. So really um, big thanks um, from from our side. And um, yeah, we'll keep in touch, I hope. <laughs> yeah, Th thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel, really. It was very nice. Thanks for the discussion and, and for taking the time to answer every question as well. <laughs> Um, in terms of terminology, as you said, Ines, I don't know if we, we sent you, maybe you didn't have the chance to look at it, but there is this session from the ERTC, we, you remember maybe during the OLIPAC meeting, we organized a session particularly on the patient-centered outcomes, and you can go back to this session, there is an explanation of the terminology, you also have the presentation, so maybe it's worth uh, going back to that, and, and, uh, and if you have any question, you can, of course, uh, Ask us. I just wanted to say that the recording will be link will be available on the Redis uh, website. Okay, uh, so again, you will have the chance to go back to it, and um, and the presentation will be there too, if that's okay with you, Daniel. We'll super thanks. We will also upload the presentation. Okay, uh, so I would like to thank you again, Daniel, for your time and for all of you for your participation. We will. See you for the next round of exchange of good practice, uh, probably before the summer. We don't know yet exactly, but we'll come back to you. We'll keep in touch and we'll see what will be the next topic. So if you are interested and would like to share your experience or anything you would like to, to share with your peers, uh, what you are doing in your year-end, please come back to us. Thanks a lot. Take care of yourself and see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.